just the last two weeks to hear from uh, Travis Snowd and then or need a break from uh, no need a break from Pastor James, but you know definitely definitely myself. But anyways, if you look at Mark chapter one, and we're going to look at verses twenty one through twenty eight here. Uh, and with God's help this morning, what we want to think about is this, is that Jesus' words, literally, they have the power to change lives. They have the power to change your life. They have the power to change the most hopeless person you know, the person you, you're praying for, and you're just like, man, I don't know what's going to happen there or, or yourself in your life. Jesus' words have the power to make a powerful change. And so we're going to uh, read that here again. Uh, in verses 21 and 28. I love, you know, in back where I'm from in the U.S., scripture readings are not as common, but I love it. I love it that it happens often here because God's word is so important. We don't want to miss that. So we're going to read it again here uh, in verse 21. And it says, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. By the way, you know, the way I'm reading this, I'm sure it sounded very, very different. When this demon screamed out, I, I'm pretty sure it was something very scary. And when Jesus rebuked this demon, I'm sure it was very powerful, very authoritative as he talks to him. So he's telling him to be quiet. He says, come out of him. When the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed in so much that they questioned among themselves saying, what thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Uh, let's pray. Let's ask God's help to illuminate uh, these, these, these words of life, this truth uh, that he has for us today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we're uh, so thankful that you come down to meet us where we're at. Lord, as we've already been looking in this, the, the good news here in, in the Gospel of Mark, that um, you came uh, at the, just the right time, and you are making a difference in people's life. And Lord, I just want to ask your forgiveness in my life and all of our lives, or even this week, we've not let you uh, have the say. Uh, maybe we've listened to our own desires, our own thoughts. We try to go our own way. And Lord, we just want to uh, repent of that, and we want to just say again that you are the one that's in control. You're the one that has authority. You're the one that has the words of life, the the, the just the blueprint that that is transformative. And so, Lord, we just pray uh, this morning as we look at these words here. Lord, help us not just to be astonished or amazed, but Lord, help us to apply it in our life. Help us to uh, puts you in your rightful place, lets you uh, powerfully change us, and Lord, let your fame spread abroad. Um, let people's lives be changed by you. Lord, we know you can. We have confidence in your word. We have confidence in who you are, that you will uh, do what you've said. So Lord, we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you know, the last few weeks we've talked, the, the uh, even this morning, we had lots of visitors, didn't we? We had lots of different uh, people from the USA, and um, you know, in the USA, we don't have as many political parties as we have here in the North or, or even in the South. And some of the visitors, as they were driving around, they saw all those uh, advertisements, all the adverts uh, for these different. And, and uh, you know, even even the last couple of weeks, I've had people come to knock on my door to talk to me. And usually, as soon as they hear my accent, they're like, "Okay, let's not spend too much time with this guy," you know. Uh, but, you know, they, they want their candidate to win, don't they? Uh, and I was trying to explain, hey, there's these uh, UUP, DUP, there's Sinn Féin, there's people before profit, there's they ought to, there's this, there's that, there's all these different parties. And, you know, a lot of times they're going around and they're knocking on doors and they're putting up their advertisements because 
they want uh, they want to have some kind of authority, don't they? They want to be able to have a say uh, when decisions are being made. Uh, they want to have some kind of power to uh, make a difference. And sometimes it even seems certain neighborhoods, uh, you could say, well, that neighborhood, they're saying, we really think these people um, are going to make the biggest difference, you know, for us and so and so forth. And uh, sometimes people, as we were driving around with people in the vans, uh, you know, going to the holiday clubs, going to the, uh, the, 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 the football tournaments, different things, do, doing outreach. They said, what, what is that flag? It's like, oh, well, that's just green and yellow. Oh, that's just for the, for the, for the team. That's just sports, you know, or this is sports or this is this. And a lot of times when they're putting up the, the, those advertisements or, or the, whoever who's doing it, uh, they're saying, man, we want this person uh, to have some kind of power, to have, have, have some kind of authority. And I just want to uh, say, you know, recently on our uh, street outreach several weeks ago, there was a guy that came up and he said, hey, are you guys, uh, are your ch- is your church, are you guys political at all? And, and we're like, no, 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 not really. And uh, he, he said, hey, would you, you guys want, we asked if we could help in any way. And he said, uh, you guys want to do some political activism? And we said, no, no, no. And we made it very clear to him. We said, no, we really just, we're all about Jesus. We want Jesus uh, we want people to know Jesus. We want Jesus to reign. We want him to have authority. And what we're seeing uh, you know, in what we just read is that Jesus wants to win in our life. Jesus wants to have authority in our life. And Jesus' words, his powerful words can change lives. And what Jesus is doing is he's publicly in a big way, he's demonstrating his power and authority to these people uh, in Capernaum. In Capernaum, and publicly, Jesus is letting everyone know that he has uh, the power. He he has he, he's not taking a poll. He is not taking. He's not going to raise an army to wrestle control. Uh, he, he he is not uh, seeing who likes him. No, he is just simply being who he is. He's being God, and he's teaching. And they've never heard teaching like this. And he's he's doing things that they never saw done. He's doing the impossible. And, you know, the last few weeks, as we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, we've asked a couple questions. We've asked, who is Jesus? Uh, We've asked, uh, why did Jesus come? What does it mean to follow Jesus? And what we've seen in chapter 1 is we know that he is declared to be the Son of God. And we know that uh, he's come to, uh, he was promised by the prophets, and John the Baptist preached about him. And what did he say? He says, behold, this is the Lamb of God. He's the one that's come to take away the sins of every single person, of everybody, of of the whole world. And then we know Jesus was, was proclaimed in front of everybody as the beloved Son of God by God the Father when he was baptized. Then he's led in the wilderness by the Holy Spirit of God, and he is sinless, and he is victorious, and Satan does not win. And he proves himself able to conquer uh, uh, Satan himself. And Jesus is going about now in Galilee, and he's preaching a certain kind of message. He's calling people to repentance. He's calling people to turn away from what they know, from what they believe, and put their faith and trust in him uh, for forgiveness of sins. Uh, he, he is calling people to believe the gospel. And we, we saw that he, he's, now he goes and he goes to Capernaum and he goes to these men, these four men, and he calls disciples, doesn't he? He says, follow me. And, and we were talking about how he went to common people. You know, I think all of us maybe, were, maybe there might be a few uncommon people in here, but we're mostly common people. And Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Doesn't, uh, being a believer, uh, it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, trusting in Christ, that's a, that, that's a miracle. Uh, you know, that's a moment. But really, being a disciple of Jesus, that's a lifetime. And we see how to do that. And now this morning, what we're going to be asking is this. Are Jesus' words, are they changing our life? Are Jesus' words, are they making any kind of impact in our life? Can they make an impact in your life? Can they change your life? And I want to submit to you this morning from what we, were, what we read, they definitely can. So I want you to notice first is that Jesus' words that, that he's teaching, that he's speaking here, they are distinctly different. They're very, very different than what these people are used to. You know, Jesus went to uh, Capernaum on the shores of Galilee. He's going to base most of his ministry here. Uh, It was trade routes. A lot of people went through Capernaum. It was a booming fishing town. And he calls these disciples. He says, hey, I want you to come out of that booming fishing industry, and I want you to become a new kind of fisher. I want you to fish for men. I want to use you. And they follow him. And Jesus, he goes to a synagogue. And, you know, something, this is a picture of a synagogue that they uncovered in Capernaum. 
and they dated the foundation back to the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, when we're reading scripture, when we're look, when we're talking about this, these are real places, real time periods. Uh, you know, all these different things, and it can be verified oftentimes with archaeology and different things. And uh, Miss Brother Oriel shared with us this morning as we were praising the Lord in prayer that there is a lady at the Holiday Bible Club, and she she told someone she says, "Hey, before we came to this, she says, my kids." We really thought we didn't know Jesus was real. We thought he was just kind of like a fairy tale or something. We didn't know that he was real, but now we know. And you know what? Uh, the people that came and helped us in our church had a part of was making Jesus real to people. You know, and even if we didn't have these piles of rocks that they find, which by the way they find they, they've never found anything that contradicts what we read in the Bible. Even if we didn't have that, just we have these words, and we can trust and we can rely on them. So Jesus, he went to the synagogue. He goes to the synagogue, and there are lots of things a synagogue would have in common with what we're doing today. You know, they would, would oftentimes, one of the first things they would do is they would pray. They would pray several times. They would pray a lot. They would say different kinds of prayers. They would sing. They would worship. Uh, they would then, after they heard all that scripture and the songs, they would hear teachings from the scripture sometimes. Sometimes they would just hear what the rabbi said about something. But oftentimes they would hear teachings from the scripture. So I want you to look at verse 22 again. So Jesus is coming to the synagogue, and it says when he teaches, they're astonished at his doctrine. Why are they astonished? Well, he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Oftentimes in a synagogue when someone was known to be a teacher and Jesus was known to be a teacher and you were visiting, it was kind of like what me and Pastor James were tempted to do. We're like, even this morning, like, oh, Oriel, um, he's going to be, we'll just ask him, you know, be instant in seat. He'll be ready. Yeah, yeah. He'll, but that was very common back then is, is, is a teacher would come and they'd say, oh, oh let's, let's have him come up and let's have him do the teachings from the scripture we're going to read. And so Jesus is there at the right time. He was there on purpose. He has a message to bring and the people are blown away. And it wasn't what he taught that God wants us to see. There's other places where God tells us what he taught in Luke, but he doesn't say it here. He just wants us to see how people responded. He wants us to see the impact that his teaching made. It was unlike anything that they had experienced. You know, scribes are mentioned a lot in scripture. You know, there were two different scribes back then. There were uh, secular scribes and there were, there were the religious scribes. And the secular scribes are a lot like a solicitor today is uh, they would uh, uh, make important documents. They would read important documents. They would notarize different things. Uh, they would interpret different things. Uh, they would make contracts. But the religious scribes were especially trained to look at the Old Testament law, uh, to look at the prophets. And people looked to these religious scribes of what it meant to be a faithful Jew. And they would oftentimes, though, if you ask them a question, Hey, what, what does God say about this? Is most of the time they wouldn't quote scripture to you. They wouldn't say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. This is what God's word says. What they would do is they would quote a rabbi. They'd say, well, Rabbi Gamaliel thinks that, it, that it's talking about this. But on the other hand, 50 years before, there was another rabbi in, uh, in Jerusalem, and he was in the temple, and he said he thinks it's this. But then there was another rabbi, uh, you know, in Galilee, and he said this. And you say, well, what do you think? Well, the rabbi said this, and this rabbi said this, and this rabbi said this. And, that's, and, the, and, then, and then there's this tradition, and these synagogues over here do this. And that's how the scribes would talk to you. They would have authority, but they always referred to other authority. They always referred to, uh, we can see from their teachings, very, they didn't mention, many times they, meant, they, they, would, they would put these rabbi sayings on equal playing field as scripture. Today it seems like there's a lot of spiritual teaching like that, isn't there? Someone say, well, this religious tradition says this. This religious tradition says that. There's this teacher on YouTube, and he has millions of subscribers, he says this. Uh, this lady over here, she wrote all these books, and it's a top seller. But what about the book? What about what God says? What about what the Word of God says? 
And, you know, one, one of the things, if you're a believer in here this morning, I believe something that all of us have thought of is this, is how can I speak in a way that can spiritually make a difference in people's life? How can I share some words where I could see people trust in Christ? What, what can I say? What can I do? A lot of us have that kind of desire to want to make a spiritual difference uh, in the world around us. And notice, you know, how Jesus would have spoken, what we know about Jesus is Jesus, he gave a divine message that he knew was from God. And friends, we have a divine message. We have a book. We have God's word in front of us. We know it's from God. That's what we need to share with people. You know, uh, Macy and Melania, I, I could just, you know, I never need to watch, turn on a TV ever again. I can just sit down and watch them and get all the entertainment I need in life. And uh, oftentimes, you know, Macy will tell Mulaney to do something, and sometimes it's something that I said. But oftentimes, she's telling her to do something I never said. And she says, Mulaney, Daddy says that you're not allowed to wear my dress-up clothes, and you know, or whatever. She says, Dad, Daddy says that only I'm allowed to play on the scooter, or whatever. And when I hear that, sometimes I even correct her, but I will not, when Mulaney throws a fit or Mulaney is not going to cooperate with Macy, I don't, I'm not going to get on Mulaney and say, listen, listen to Macy. No, I'm going to say, I didn't say that. I'm not going to help Macy's words. I'm not going to help what Macy said because that's not what I said. But when Macy tells her, she said, hey, daddy says that we need to go in and clean the room. And Mulaney is, mm, 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 and she doesn't want to listen. Well, then I'll say, hey, listen to your sister. That's what I said, and I'm willing to come in and help her. And oftentimes when, when the, these scribes, their words were dead, their, their words didn't have spiritual uh, power because God's like, I didn't say that. I, I, I didn't say that. That, that. that doesn't come from me. And friends, when, when you and I teach or, or the Bible or talk about Scripture, we can know that we have authority from God when we're just talking about the Bible. But when I'm talking to you or Pastor James or anybody else, we talk to you about our theories or our speculations or our opinions or our ideas, you really could just take it or leave it. But when, when it's God's words, we need to receive that. We, we, we need to take that on. And friends, we need to ask ourselves, Jesus, he shared a message he knew was from God. Are we sharing messages from God? Are we sharing what the scripture says? Are we sharing our desires? And then I also want you to notice about Jesus is Jesus, he definitely knew what he was talking about, didn't he? Um, you think about, there's classes out there, you know, I'm sure Addie Bola would know. You could go to university and you could have classes and people talk to you about farming. And they've never done any farming in their life. But they could tell you. There's people you could go to, you go to a university and he, he, the engineer will tell you about mathematic equations of how to build a skyscraper, but that they have never been an engineer in their life, right? There's people that can talk to you about being an accountant, but they've never been in that high stress situation in a bank, you know, and all these different things. And a lot of times people might know about a subject, but they don't really know the subject, do they? You know, Jesus, he knew the subject because he was a subject. And there's many times where you and I, we don't speak with authority to people, God's authority, with spiritual power, because we don't know Jesus. We don't know his word like we, like we, we should. Um, there's a big difference in knowing about God and knowing God personally, isn't there? These scribes in Jerusalem, they could talk all about, well, this rabbi said this, this rabbi said this, and this is what this says, but they couldn't say, no, I know God, and I have a personal relationship with God. This is what God is saying here. And we even know that. Remember, remember, in, that, remember in Bethlehem when the, the, the wise men were asking, where is Jesus, the one that's going to be born, king of the Jews? And they said, oh, yeah, uh, it says over here that he's going to be born over there. Yeah, a few miles away from them, not, not even a day's journey. And those scribes, there's no record of them going to go visit the king of the Jews because it was just academic for them. It wasn't real. It wasn't personal. And so Jesus, he knew what he was talking about. And when we know Jesus, when we know his word, we can speak with power. We can speak with authority. But Jesus taught with authority because he believed in what he taught. I used to work in an Italian restaurant, my first job. 
It was the day after I turned 60, my first real job. I had other jobs that were kind of shady. But anyways, this is the real one. And this one, on the, on, there was a plaque on, on the wall of the, of the owners. And one, there's a picture of one that was like a cartoon. One was Big Mike, and he was big, okay? There was Big Terry, and he was bigger. And then there was Little Mikey. That's what they said. And Little Mikey was bigger than, he was almost, he was bigger than both of them. Little Mikey wasn't little, but he was the youngest. And they owned the restaurant. And they had, a, they had another sign underneath that one, and they said, never trust a skinny cook. And their food was good, okay? They, they ate their food. Their food is really, really good. And friends, Jesus really believed what he taught. Jesus had tasted what he was serving. Jesus really experienced uh, because, because he was a subject. And friends, when you and I believe God's word, when we're tasting it ourselves, when we share it with others, it, it will show. It will make a difference. So Jesus spoke with authority that only God the Father spoke with. They hadn't heard anybody speak like this. When Jesus taught, he wasn't telling you what some other authority had said. His authority was rooted in his identity as a son of God, as a king of the world. In Matthew 5, Jesus, I think it was like eight or nine times, he says something like this. He says, you may have heard someone tell you once this over here, that, that, that you should not commit adultery. You may have heard someone over here say this. Uh, about not hating someone, but I tell you this. What was Jesus saying? He says, you may have heard all these scribes from this synagogue over here or this rabbi from this place over here. And in Matthew 5, one of my favorites, he says, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. He says, that's the word on the street. That's what everyone's saying is the way to live. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And friends, spiritual authority is not rooted in man-made opinions or traditions or religions or desires. Spiritual truth is rooted in Jesus Christ. And we live in a time where Jesus' authority, his words, they're, they're ignored or they're attacked. And people get spiritual truth from loads of places, don't they? Uh, oftentimes, people will hold more to what their denomination says to what the religious tradition says, to what their church leader says, to what a popular opinion says, than what God's words say. And they only will trust what the Bible says if the Bible agrees with, with that church father or, or that creed or that council or that popular opinion. And God says, that's false teaching. All you need are my words. You don't need all that extra stuff. Colossians uh, 2 uh, warns us of this. Paul says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's empty. It's empty that you're being deceived after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world. You know, that popular opinion there, not after Christ. And before that, he says, you need to be rooted in Christ. He says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Second Timothy 4 tells us this about, about people who want to usurp. Uh, Christ's authority, what's going to happen? He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that's talking about God's words alone. But after their own lust, shall uh, their desires, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They're, they're going to have people that just are going to tell them what they want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And oftentimes when we stop believing in the simple truths of God's words about, about uh, salvation, about family, about creation, about, uh, about how we should treat people. And we're going to be start believing very crazy, wild things. What has authority in your life? What has sway in your life? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're answering that honestly, truly, honestly, is it yourself? Is it God's words? Is it perhaps the person who has the most influence in your life? Is it the one that has the most popular TikTok video? Is it the one that has the most subscribers on YouTube? Is it the one that has the most books? Is it the one that's going to tell you what you want to hear? Who has influence in your life? And Jesus is saying, hey, I have authority. I, I, I can make a difference in your life. I have the power. Jesus is telling them, you want something reliable. Do you want something foundational for your life? Do you want something real? It's me. 
He literally breathed out the words that we're studying today. And anytime I deviate or anytime we deviate from uh, what God's word says, and we have no authority, we have no power to change lives, to change our own life, apart from God's spiritual truth here in his word. So we see Jesus is very different. His authority is different. But Jesus' authority, what it does when his authority shows up, Jesus' authority reveals our sin. So if you look at verse 23 and 24, so Jesus is is teaching here. The people are surprised. And as he's teaching, they're in the synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And, you know, I was reading about this, and some people said, oh, you know, this man was in that uh, synagogue, and, man, he shouldn't have felt comfortable. You know, it's kind of – Someone said, they said, oh, he felt very comfortable in that synagogue, didn't he? Like, kind of like, oh, wow, that that synagogue was a bad place, that the, that that man would even go to that synagogue. And I'm like, no, that's hogwash. He was in that synagogue, I believe, because he was seeking spiritual change. This man was desperate. This, this man needed help. And he's in that synagogue, and one thing you can say is that synagogue, those scribes with their, their empty teaching. We're not going to help this man. So this scribe, this, 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 this demon-possessed man, this hopeless man, this impossible man, this desperate man, in verse 23, he's there, and this unclean spirit in him, he cries out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one who yelps is the one that got hit. And anywhere Jesus' power and his authority goes, it reveals something. It reveals imperfection, God's holiness. It reveals rebellion. It reveals a uh, sin. And all throughout God's word, we see that encountering God just exposes who we are. We know Adam and Eve, when God was coming, what do they do? They, they run and they hide from God. We think about Moses as he encounters God in that burning bush. What does he do? He falls on his face and he takes off his shoes, takes off his sandals. You think about Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah, he sees holy God. And what does he say? He says, woe is me. He says, I, 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 am, I, am an, I have unclean lips. He says, everyone around me is unclean. And he says, woe is me. Peter, what does he do when he comes face to face with God? He says, depart from me, Lord. He said, I'm a sinful man. And the good news, folks, is this, is Jesus never turns away anybody. He never turns away a sinner. He never turns away uh, anybody. He cleanses them. He changes them. He uses them. Think about Peter, the one who denied him, the one who, uh, who, whose arrogance was so evident. And yet God, through Peter, he uses him. He's patient with him. He nurtures the, the faith that he had. I think about Isaiah. Isaiah said, hey, I'm unclean. I'm unworthy, God. I, I, I'm undone. He's tell, he tells God. But yet God's, Isaiah says, here am I, send me. And God uses him in a needy, uh, needy time. Think about Moses with all his, the murderer Moses, the fearful Moses, and how God uses him. And how Adam and Eve, how God sacrifices that lamb as a picture of Jesus, and he covers them. And he promises them that one day the Savior would come. So friends, Jesus' authority, what it does is it reveals our condition. It reveals who we are. It reveals our our sin. And, you know, you see the demons here. It reveals these demons, these these unclean spirits that were in this man. What do you believe about demons? What do you think about demons? Do you have much of an opinion about them? There's lots of people today, uh, um, you know, uh, modern Christianity, where they say, no, these demons aren't real. It's just some kind of undiagnosed illness. That's all it was. It was some kind of mental illness. They weren't able to, to diagnose it, so they just said it was demons. And friends, I could spend some time this morning uh, telling you about demon possession I witnessed in Sri Lanka. I could tell you about that. I'm not going to take the time to do that because they undeniably exist, not because of my experience, because the Bible says they do. Because the Bible is authoritative enough. It describes them from Genesis uh, to Revelation as real spiritual beings. God created them to be his messengers. God created them to spread uh, his glory throughout the ar- his earth, to live under his authority. Instead, they became evil spirits. They rebelled against God. And they wanted to live for themselves. They wanted to live for Satan. So what are they about today? What, what, 
why do they, what, are they, what are they doing? What are they obsessed about today? Well, we know their ruler is Satan. And in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says they want to hide the gospel. They want to hide. They don't want people to trust in Christ for salvation. They don't want people's sins to be forgiven. They don't want people to have a relationship with God. They want, don't want people to have the hope in he of heaven. It says if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. They are actively trying to thwart the gospel. Those demons did not want that man underneath the teaching of Jesus in that synagogue. You know, exorcists were not unique in Jesus' day. But the way that Jesus gets rid of this demon, it was unique. A lot of times uh, a Jewish exorcist, and even today when someone's trying to cast out a demon, is they would uh, use rituals. They would take lots of time. They would use all these spells and incantations and uh, these different artifacts to cast a demon out. And they believed, and this is a belief even today, they believed that if you knew the name of the demon, you would have special authority over that demon. If you knew the name of that demon, then you would be able to put that demon underneath your control. This demon is trying to turn the tables on Jesus. Say, I know your name, Jesus. I know who you are. It's not going to work. I believe this demon ultimately knew it was powerless before Jesus. How did this demon know who Jesus was? Jesus was there when he was cast out. Jesus was there when he rebelled against him. And he's kind of running. Have you ever run into somebody in Tesco that you actually didn't want to, you didn't want to run into, you know? This is kind of what's happening. Jesus, that never happened. I, I always want to run into everybody, okay? But, but this demon this did not want to run into Jesus. And he's like, oh, man, I know who you are. I remember when you cast me out, and you're going to do the same thing. You, you, you're, 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 and and he, he, says, he says, you're going to destroy us. So, friends, he knew who Jesus was. He knew that God came to deliver people from their sin and from Satan through his death on the cross. There's a great interest in the supernatural today and, and witchcraft, and it seems that, that it's increasing. I, I read some polls that says, man, every year uh, it's just exponentially increasing people's interest in the occult and paganism. And, and as believers, we don't need to just treat Satan like he's just a symbol of evil. We need to treat him as he is a real person. And Satan is an angel of light. He is a deceiver. He is a lion that walks about seeking who he can devour and destroy. But as believers, we have Jesus Christ, who is infinitely more powerful than him. And I want you to see lastly this morning, we'll be finished, is Jesus' authority can make a real difference in your life. Verse 25 and 26, he rebukes him. He tells him to pretty much, he says, shut up, hold your peace. Come out of him. When the unclean spirit had torn him, he cried with a loud voice. He came out of him. I don't know what was going through this man's mind when he walked in this synagogue. It was hopeless. It was impossible. He was under the control of Satan. Religion could not help him. Only Jesus could help this man. And friends, this morning, I want to just declare hope to you that there is hope for the very worst. There's hope for the most impossible, the most hardened of hearts. Don't stop praying for that loved one. Don't stop sharing the words of Christ with the people that you know. This man that everyone probably just wrote off, Jesus is going to make a difference in his life. 1 John 3, 8 is, 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 a, is a verse of hope to me. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God. Why was the Son of God? Why was Jesus? Why did he come to this earth? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Today, Jesus can destroy the works of the devil, the works of sin in our life. Colossians 2.15, he says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, that's talking about the dark power of Satan. He says he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When he died on that cross, he was saying, hey, you guys don't have any power. You thought you got me. You thought you had power. Just like this, this demon is saying his name, trying to have power over Jesus. 
He has no power compared to Jesus. And I just want to challenge you this morning. Maybe in your heart, you just, you, you've just been dealing with, maybe you want to call it an addiction. Maybe you want to call it a stronghold. Maybe you want to uh, call it uh, just this cloud that's over you. Maybe a cloud of, 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 uh, of anger, of discontentment, of fear, of comparison, of, of lust, of division. And friends, that Jesus can come in your life, and if you let his words, you let his power, you let his presence into your life, he has the power as your king to triumph over Satan, to triumph over the sin in our life, to triumph over the strongholds that are in our, our life. Nothing can stand against him. May we say, as Jesus told Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to give no place to the devil. And friends, you don't have to feel oppressed by spiritual darkness. Jesus can set you free from it. You know, a believer cannot be possessed by Satan. We know from Scripture that we can be oppressed by Satan. We can be attacked by Satan, but we can never be controlled by him. Uh, God tells us to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We can resist the devil because Jesus resisted the devil. And if you're a believer, you have Jesus in you, the hope of glory. Verse 27 and 28, these people are astonished. These people are amazed. It causes people to start uh, questioning what just happened and saying, you know, man, this is kind of new teaching. This is new authority, man. Even the unclean spirits obey him and his fame spreads abroad. Makes me think of a similar passage in Acts chapter 2 when they heard the preaching about Jesus. It says, therefore, Peter speaking, he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye crucified, both Lord, he's the boss, and Christ, he's God. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Sadly, that's not what you see here in Mark 1. The people don't say, what, Jesus, what do we do? How do we respond? They're astonished. They're amazed. There's lots of talk about Jesus. There's lots of talk about religious things. There's lots of talk about his power over demons. But it stops there. Jesus starts trending on, on TikTok, you could say. He's in all the latest headlines. He's, he's being shared all over the social media. He's on everyone's lips. But it doesn't say here in Mark 1 that people trusted in him for forgiveness of sin. It doesn't say that people trusted in him for heaven. It doesn't say that people entered into a personal relationship with God. It just says that people were talking Jesus talk. And there's a lot of Jesus talk today. But we don't hear much about repentance or exclusive faith and trust in Christ here. Friends, knowing truths about Jesus is not the same as trusting Jesus to be the Lord of your life. To, to, for the forgiveness of your sin. How do you and I respond to the authority of Jesus? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I want to challenge you as you've heard the word of God today and we've heard about Jesus as that he is, he is God, he is sinless. He went to the cross, he died for us. That the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish of everlasting life. He that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're here and you don't know heaven is your home, you've never had forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ alone. You don't know that you have a personal relationship with God. Today is a day that you can make that decision. You can respond to Jesus' words, to his authority. Are God's words, if you're a believer this morning, are God's words authoritative in your life? Do you let God's words have a, have a shot at you? Do you open up the book? Do you read it? Do you meditate on it? Do you study it? Do, does God's word have any place in your life in your day-to-day? Are you under his authority? Are you amazed by it? You know, we can be like the demons. We can know what is true in God's word. Say, I know this is something I'm struggling with, but we can fight against it. But may we respond to Jesus today. Are you ama just amazed by God's words and, or do you apply it personally in your life? 
And then finally this morning, are you telling others about what Jesus has done in your life? In Matthew 28, some of Jesus' last words, he says, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he says, because of that, because I have authority and you are my followers, you are my disciples, he says, go ye therefore into all the world, teaching all nations. And he says, I, lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. So even today, amen. So I want to challenge you, are you, are you, his fame can be spread abroad today. All sources of truth in our life, everything in our life needs to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. No person, sin, Satan himself cannot stand against God. And when Jesus has authority in our life, when Jesus has proper place in this church, when Jesus has the proper place and his word is supreme in our lives, you know what's going to happen? His fame is going to be spread abroad. People are going to notice. People are going to be amazed and astonished when just one person, they see Jesus' Jesus' authority. It's kind of like how someone can put up a flag or wear a sports jersey and people know, oh, man, that person is a fan of this team. This person is a fan of this political ideology. When a believer says, I'm going to live under the authority of Jesus, I want Jesus' words to guide my life, and people are going to notice. Does Jesus have the say? Does he have the authority? Can people tell by the way you and I live that Jesus is the king of our hearts? I want to invite you this morning, if you're here and you'd say, Josh, you guys talk about a lot here. Um, Maybe you're listening online. Maybe you're here and you'd say, "I, I don't know if I were to die today that I would go to heaven. You talk about Jesus came to bring eternal life, but I don't know about that. I would like to know more about that. Please. Reach out to us. Talk to us. We'd love to show you from the Bible how to know that Christ has saved us, forgiven you of your sins. But if you're here as a believer, it's very important when we hear God's words that we respond to it. Maybe you know of an area in your life that says, man, I'm just really struggling with this. I've been letting this bitterness rule my life. I've been letting the, the, this, this de- deceitful pattern rule my life. I, I, I've been letting this fear rule my life. I want Jesus to be the king there. I want him to have authority. Let's go to him. And just like he was able to go to this impossible demon-possessed man, Jesus can have authority in our life as well. Let's pray. And then Pastor James will come up here. Lord Jesus, again, we're, we're, we're just amazed and we are astonished that you would come as in the flesh you would you 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 would experience, Lord, all the temptations, all the hardships that we experience. But Lord, you showed us how to live a better life through that, how to live a full, abundant life, how to have eternal life. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of having our sins forgiven, having the gift of not having to be giving in to the power of sin, but be able to live victoriously through the power of your word, through the power power of your Holy Spirit, through the power of your resurrection. Lord, I pray if there's uh, someone here, maybe a believer, and they're struggling maybe with a certain addiction, a certain uh, stronghold in their life. Lord, I pray that they would run to your words, run into your presence. Lord, that you would, uh, we know that you would be, you'll be patient and you'll nurture them and you will help them bit by bit to have victory in their life. Lord, I want to pray for for those that maybe they're not a believer. They haven't, uh, they're not born again, as you've said. Lord, I pray today might be the day where uh, they 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 investigate that. They ask the question. They 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 try to uh, understand what it means to be saved. Lord, I pray uh, now as we continue our service this week today. Lord, it's so easy for us. The way that we talk with others is, Lord, we're constantly sharing other people's opinions and ideas and thoughts. Lord, help us, whether people realize it or not as you're talking to them, Lord, help us to share your heart with people. Help us to reflect your thoughts with people, not our own. Lord, help us reflect your authority here on earth. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Josh. And one thing I know is uh, Jesus will save your soul.